okay, tonsillitis and adenoiditis. Um, tonsillitis, inflammation of your tonsils, and adenoiditis is inflammation of your adenoids. Usually they occur together and they're more common in children, and so you might actually see this when you're um, studying pediatrics. Um, but it's a disease that involves your lymph system, um, and your lymph system is what your body uses um, for filtering out um, of a lot of waste from your blood and everything and carrying it out um, to where it actually will eventually be filtered through your kidneys and eliminated, but um, it basically takes out like infectious materials and things and just kind of breaks it down. So that's the most down and dirty way I can explain the lung system. Anyway, um, it can be secondary to upper respiratory infections, a lot of them really, um, but it's a chronic tonsil infection that leads to enlargement um, typically of your adenoids as well, and it'll eventually cause upper respiratory obstruction, meaning it's really tough to breathe. Um, and if you don't remember where your adenoids are, here they are, right here, okay? Um, chronic adenoidal infection, so if you chronically get um, infection up in your adenoids can eventually lead to an ear infection, otherwise known as otitis media. Um, the signs and symptoms of tonsillitis and adenoiditis is a sore throat, um, difficulty swallowing, um, fear, fever, um, malaise, enlarged adenoids, which eventually causes um, obstruction in your nose where it's difficult to breathe, difficult um, to really speak without sounding nasally, um, you know, like, good, I sound kind of nasally right now, right? Okay, so um, noisy breathing or snoring, especially when you're sleeping, but sometimes when you're awake, you kind of can hear the people breathe, like, you know what I'm talking about? You've all heard it. I know you have. You also might notice some red or enlarged tonsils. Um, whenever you ask them to open their mouths, you're going to see them swollen and reddened. Um, whenever you do the tongue depressor and say, go, ah, they're red and they're swollen. Um, you also will probably see wet, white exudate, like those patches that we see in strep A. Um, and it's... This can also be caused by strep A. Um, and so this is one of those things that can eventually come about if you end up having pharyngitis caused by strep A, eventually leads to tonsillitis and adenoiditis as well. To treat it, we gotta give them antibiotics. We gotta get that out of there because if strep A is allowed to persist, we all know what can happen. They can have rheumatic carditis, infective endocarditis, glomerulonephritis, yikes, yikes, yikes. We wanna give them some pain medications because it is really uncomfortable. So. Typically, we're going to start them off with like some Tylenol, maybe some ibuprofen, but um, if that doesn't cut it, we can give them something a little bit stronger, um, but we'll see how they go. Um, saline gargles just help to soothe the throat, and they actually do help to break out, um, break up some of that exudate that's settling on the tonsils, and, um, and it helps to just kind of, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it helps to heal it, actually. It's very helpful. Um, if it gets really bad and they have um, multiple infections, um, and it's a chronic um, condition, then they might end up having to do a tonsillectomy or an adenoidectomy. A long time ago, and some of you might remember this, um, or maybe have experienced this, they used to remove tonsils on every child, um, like at age seven or whatever, um, just because they thought, oh, then this is just gonna prevent strep infections from ever occurring. Well, it didn't really work the way they wanted it to, because while most strep infections do originate in your throat, strep infections can go anywhere. And if they're going to go anywhere, we kind of would rather them go to the throat, wouldn't we? Now, if you have tonsils with very deep grooves and um, you know large um, pockets in them that bacteria lodges in more easily, and this is a chronic condition, then yeah, we're going to go ahead and remove those tonsils. But if we don't have to remove them, then why undergo the surgical procedure? It's just not necessary. Um, so, like we said, if it's chronic or it's repeated, meaning it happens often or if there's hypertrophy of the tonsils and your adenoids, or if you have serious ear infections as a result of the tonsillitis and adenoiditis, we probably will go ahead and, and take out um, the tonsils and the adenoids. And the client and family teaching for you is in your book on page 250. And I prefer um, for you to go ahead and do that on your own. Just you can pause the video now, look at that briefly, make sure you understand what you're gonna be teaching your patient and their family about if they have to have this surgery. Okay, so I'm giving you a break so you can pause. Laryngitis. Um, we're going on with another disease right now. It's not really, well, anyway, let's talk about it. Laryngitis is just basically inflammation and swelling of your mucous membranes that line your larynx. And if you remember, your larynx is your voice box. Now, I'm going to jump on a soapbox for two seconds because you know I love my soapboxes. So, larynx and pharynx, pharynx, it's not pronounced larynx and pharynx. Look at how it's spelled L A R Y N X, right? Larynx, not larynx. 
the N does not come before the Y. So that's a little soapbox. I'm jumping off. It's all about pronunciation, and it just makes you sound more intelligent when you pronounce things correctly. Just letting you know. All right, so inflammation of your voice box. Now, what do you think that's going to affect? Oh, I know, I know. Your voice. All right, so whenever you have swelling of your vocal cords, um, a lot of times it's coming alongside of some kind of inflammation. Usually it's caused by some other kind of upper respiratory infection, and this is a side effect or a byproduct of the other upper respiratory infection. It also can be caused by excessive or improper use of your voice. Opera singers and people who are on Broadway tend to get laryngitis because they're constantly yelling or, you know, like projecting their voice. Um, I've gotten it before after several days of teaching in a row. Um, also because whenever you sing, you're really using your vocal cords a lot more forcefully than if um, you're just talking like I'm talking right now, right? Um, allergies can also cause it if you have multiple allergic reactions back to back. A lot of times it puts undue um, swelling and inflammation on your um, larynx, which can eventually cause you to lose your voice temporarily. Smoking absolutely causes um, laryngitis. Now, something that's very, very important to remember um, the way that laryngitis presents itself is in hoarseness of the voice. That's normal. It goes away on its own typically pretty, um, pretty quickly, usually within a day or two. But if the hoarseness is allowed to persist, or not even just allowed, but if it does persist on its own, um, typically if it persists like two weeks or more, that is a sign of laryngeal cancer, and that needs very prompt attention. Because if you start noticing that somebody has a hoarse voice for a very long time, and, and you start wondering, oh, I wonder if it's laryngeal cancer. Don't hold your tongue. Don't um, not say anything. Say, oh, hey, I remembered that, you know, prolonged hoarseness of the voice can be a sign of laryngeal cancer. Do you think you might want to get that checked out? Not to scare them, not to freak them out. Don't say, oh, you definitely have laryngeal cancer because that's not therapeutic. That's not helpful. You just want to refer them to their doctor and just say, hey, why don't you get that checked out? Just make sure everything's okay, right? Because we always want to catch things as early as possible. Um, but with um, signs and symptoms of laryngitis, again, a lot of times they're going to have the inability to speak louder than a whisper. They're going to be like, hey, I'm trying to talk to you, but I can't. Right? Okay. Also, aphonia, um, where they just can't talk at all. Right? Um, they're also, they might have a sore throat. This is not a definite, because sometimes you can have laryngitis that's not involving inflammation of anything else in your throat, and so you might not even feel it. You just can't talk. Um, you also might notice a dry and unproductive cough just because of the aggravation of your larynx um, and probably the swelling and, and just, you know, everything that's in there. Um, and so a lot of times that causes you to cough. And it's unproductive because it's not anything that is caused by your lungs or a serious infection or anything. So you just, you know, roll with it. Um, so the way that you treat it is rest your voice. If you are an opera singer and you get laryngitis, don't do a performance. Don't go out there and sing because it's going to aggravate your larynx even further. If it's caused by smoking, oh my gosh, please stop smoking. So bad for you. Don't do it. Um, if it's caused by an infection, give them antibiotics. Um, whatever it is, just rest your voice and a lot of times it gets better pretty quickly. All right, here's a question. After two weeks of symptomatic treatment for pharyngitis, which led to laryngitis, your client complains of hoarseness. The physician schedules a direct laryngoscopy. Now, we haven't really looked at laryngoscopies on these videos, but what do you think that is? It's just a scope goes down um, the throat and you can visualize the larynx. Um, so which statement made by the client best indicates that the client understands the rationale for the direct laryngoscopy? What do you think? Woo! Okay, the only answer that has a correct statement here is C. I need to have the test because hoarseness is a sign of laryngeal cancer because we just learned that it is. So, good job. I'm going to stop this video and we'll come back and look at some more.